15 convicted. You then set the house on fire with your brother still in the house for a brutal murder. You beat her to death with what? A uh, sledgehammer. The exclusive prison interview. Did you laugh when you were hitting her? Yeah. Why did you kill her? I'm here at the Sumner County Jail in Gallatin, Tennessee. Behind these barbed wire fences and brick walls, in almost total isolation, sits 17-year-old Zachary Davis. He was just 15 years old when he brutally bludgeoned his mother to death with a sledgehammer as she slept in her bed. Police say he then set fire to his house, leaving his older brother alive inside to die in the flames. Breaking news out of Henderson, Tennessee. Melanie Davis is beaten to death with a sledgehammer. And then moments later, her home goes up in flames. Her 16-year-old son barely makes it across the street to tell a neighbor, hey, call 911. Cops track down the intruder, and police say it is her 15-year-old son. Any police or medical? I need both. Is there a fire? They just got to set a fire. Uh, I think a fire has set me game. I see the flames. According to police, Davis killed his mom around 11 p.m. on August the 10th. And then set the house on fire uh, while his brother... Uh, Josh was uh, lying asleep. And according to police, when Davis was caught, he had a letter confessing to killing his mother and leaving his brother to burn in the fire he started. Davis has been charged with first-degree murder and is accused of killing his mother with a sledgehammer while she was asleep. A shackled and much thinner Zachary Davis remained silent as he entered this Sumner County courtroom. Experts for the defense testified that Davis is a schizophrenic paranoid type who cannot help his attorney mount a defense. But experts with Middle Tennessee Mental Health Institute who evaluated Davis three times disagree. According to testimony by the defense call forensic psychologist, Davis says the voice of his dead father told him he needed to punish his mother and brother. Davis's father died from ALS a few years before his mother's murder, and that's when defense experts say his mental illness began. The state called experts that disagree, saying Davis is mentally ill, but instead of schizophrenia, he's clinically depressed and is competent to stand trial. His defense attorney, Randy Lucas, asked me to interview Zachary because he says that even though four mental health experts evaluated him, none of them could agree on his mental state or a diagnosis. He stated that Zachary would barely engage or even talk to the evaluators. Nevertheless, a judge had to make a decision. Zachary was determined to be mentally competent to stand trial, and now his attorney is concerned that Zachary will get lost in the adult criminal justice system with no rehabilitation, medication, or counseling. Is this young man a cold-blooded murderer and monster? Or is he an extremely mentally ill teenager? I want to warn you, parts of this interview are disturbing, and sometimes it's hard to believe what you are hearing. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Phil. But I do have a lot of uh, questions for you, so I want to give you a chance to tell your side of things. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Tell me how old you are. I'm 17 now. Were you going to school when you were arrested? Yeah. What grade were you in? I was uh, about to go into the 10th. Before you were arrested, what did you do for fun? I usually uh, read some books or uh, play with my friends. Do you read a lot? Yeah. You're actually quite a good writer. I've read some of the things that you've written and you're able to express yourself well. Is this the way you talk all the time, the way you're talking now? Yeah, this is how I usually talk. Now, tell me who all was living in the house up to the time that you were arrested. Was it just you and Josh and your mother? Yeah. Did you talk to her on a regular basis? Like, would you talk to her every day? I didn't talk to her that much. Did you love your mother? Mm-hmm. Is that a, a yes? 
Yes. Uh, what was she like as a mother? Did she take care of you? Uh, no. I mean, did she do your laundry? Did she fix you lunch? Did she help you around the house? Did she do things for you? We usually did that ourselves. Okay. Did you ever yell at your mother? No. Did she make you mad about things? I uh, got mad at her, but uh, usually I dealt that with that in my own way. Which is how? I just tried to do something to get my mind off it, like uh, walking around or exercising. Mm -hmm. Did you have any particular problems with your mother leading up to the night that she died? I don't think so. I'd say it uh, built up over time. And what was it that built up over time? The anger. And what was it you were angry with her about? I just didn't think she was a capable uh, parent. And in what way did she fail you? She wasn't able to take care of me and my brother. And when you say she wasn't able to take care of you, was there a time in your life when you needed her to step up and be a mother and protect you and she did not do it? Most of the time. Most of the time. And what was it she failed to protect you about? After my father died, I uh, pretty much ended up raising myself. Your father died when you were nine. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he had Lou Gehrig's disease? Mm -hmm. Did your mother take care of him? Did she comfort him towards the end? Yeah. You say that your brother started to hurt you? Yeah, molested me. And, and tell me when you remember that happening the first time. It was in my childhood. Was your father still alive? No. It was after your father passed? Did this happen a lot? Just uh, once. We were alone and he uh, attacked me. And it was just the two of you in the house, or was your mother in the house, too? My mother was outside. And how much older um, is your brother? <laughs> uh, about a year and a half. You, you just laughed a little bit. Tell me what you laughed about. I was uh, just thinking. Yeah, what were you thinking about? Just uh, some of the things we did together and before that. Good things? Yeah. Yeah. When you say he attacked you, what did he do? He uh, tackled me. And then what? He uh, ripped my clothes off me. And what did he do then? He uh, molested me. <laughs> Tell me what you just thought of. It's just embarrassing to me. Yeah. And I'm sorry about that. I, I don't, I'm not asking you to embarrass you. Uh, did he rape you? Yeah. He did? Did he hurt you? Mm -hmm. Did you tell your mother? I uh, tried to, but she wouldn't listen. And when you say she wouldn't listen, what did she say? She got angry and started yelling at me. Well, did she say you were lying? Did she tell you to stop saying it? I don't remember exactly, but I remember she was uh, telling me that I was lying. Now, your, your brother is not here to tell his side of things. Would he deny this? Probably. And these are just your allegations against him. We don't have any proof that he did this to you. Some people would say you would make these things up to try to create some justification. But this is part of what you say built up in you towards your mother, that she just wasn't there for you. 
What did you want her to do when you told her? What, what, would, what should she have done? Uh, uh, I'm expecting her to do something. Do something to protect you? Yeah. Did he ever do it again? No. You stopped taking baths. You said, I, I smelled like something that was decomposing along the side of the road. It had been so long since I took a bath. But I didn't want to take a bath because I didn't want to get naked. You didn't want to be exposed. You didn't want to be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Did your mother notice that you weren't taking a bath? Uh, she did, but she didn't say anything about it. Was it after this happened that you started cutting yourself? Yeah. And where did you cut yourself? My wrist. And what did you cut yourself with? Uh, I sometimes used a razor blade, but most of the time I used a pocket knife. Why did you cut yourself? I liked feeling it. Did it relieve the stress you felt? It did? Uh -huh. It did not work long term because this continued to build up in you, right? Yeah. Did you kill your mother? Yeah. You killed your mother. And why did you kill her? Coming up. You're standing outside her bedroom door. You've got a sledgehammer in one hand. You've got your hand on the doorknob with the other. And you open that door and walk through it. What's going through your head at that moment? <laughs> Monday on Dr. Phil. They say their former employees turned their town against them. We're terrorized in the community. Carrie created a hate group. It is yeah. not a hate group. All over the closing of a children's store. You're saying that they were liars and thieves. Now. You posted a picture of our baby and told people to hurt him. That never happened. Shepherds wear as both sides face off. This is my turn to talk. No, it's my turn to talk. You didn't do this because you had a crush on Dave. That's Monday. We now return to Mentally Ill or Monster, a Dr. Phil exclusive. The neighbors say that this was a wonderful family, a mother, 46 years old, her two sons, recently widowed, her, son, her husband died of Lou Gehrig's disease, raising her two children. She was a legal assistant by day, just a very normal family. So she is bludgeoned to death at night with a sledgehammer. The house is set on fire. Her other son runs out, he survives, and now her 15-year-old son has been charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder of his brother. Did you kill your mother? Me, me, yeah. You killed your mother. And why did you kill her? She uh, wasn't taking care of my family. Meaning you and your brother? Yeah. Is that who you mean? Uh-huh. And so because she wasn't taking care of you and your family, you decided to kill her. Did you think about discussing it with her instead of killing her? I didn't think it wouldn't do anything. You thought it won't do any good to talk to her, so I'll just kill her. Uh, when did you decide to kill your mother? I decided the day I did it. And the method you chose was what? Uh, beating her to death. And you, you beat her to death with what? A uh, sledgehammer. Uh -huh. And how many times did you hit her with the sledgehammer? I don't remember. About. Did you hit her once or did you hit her ten times or a hundred times? I'd say about twenty times. Was this a three-pound sledgehammer, five-pound sledgehammer? I don't know. Heavy? 
Yeah. It's way bigger than a hammer. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where did you hit her? In the head. Uh -huh. Where was she when you did this? She was in her room. What was she doing? She was asleep. Okay, so your mother was asleep in her room. And you opened the door and went in there? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you, you need to help me understand here. You're standing outside her bedroom door. You've got a sledgehammer in one hand. You've got your hand on the doorknob with the other. And you open that door. What's going through your head at that moment? I don't remember. My mind was pretty much blank. Where did you get the hammer? I uh, got it from our garage. Did you go out to the garage to get it that night? Uh-huh. And this was about 11 o'clock at night, right? Yeah. So where were you right before you went to the garage? Where were you when you made up your mind to do it? I was in the living room. Why kill her that night? Why not kill her a week earlier or a week later? Something made that night the night. I had enough. You had enough? Why that day? I just uh, thought it was a good time. You remember opening the door, right? It wasn't locked? It wasn't. Did you stand there and look at her for a minute before you did it? Yeah. Did you say goodbye to her in your mind? No. And when you swung that hammer the first time, did you swing it hard? Yes. Did you swing from over your head? <laughs> I mean, was this a big swing from over your head? Did she make a noise? I could just hear the hammer hitting her head. And what did it sound like? It was this, uh, what thumping sound. <laughs> yeah. How long before you hit her the second time? Just a few seconds. Did you think she was already dead? Uh, she woke up and she started, uh, seizing up. Did she look at you? Uh, looked into her eyes, but, uh, she didn't look at me. You looked into her eyes? And what did you see? I just saw them staring at me. And then you hit her again. And again. Yeah. You said maybe 20 times? About. Why so many? Uh, and I wanted to uh, make sure she was dead. Zachary certainly did open up and talk to me, reportedly much more than ever before. But you will notice his low, flat, and distinctly monotone voice and affect. This appears to be dissociative behavior, where he withdraws from content, the reality of which threatens his coping skills. He might otherwise become overwhelmed. It's also hard to ignore the strange bobbing of his head, as well as some moments where he laughs inappropriately. Now, the head bobbing appears to be a ritualistic, self-soothing behavior, again, to fight off anxiety. And the laughter suggests breaks with reality and is most likely tied to some movie in his head that only he can see. Common symptoms of disorders ranging from severe anxiety to schizophrenia. We'll be right back. Coming up. Well, if you had it to do over again, what would you do? Oh, 
mentally ill or monster. A Dr. Phil exclusive continues. After you killed your mother that night, did you close the door and lock it? I think so. Why did you do that? No, I don't remember. You told the police that you did it because you didn't want your brother, Josh, to come in and try to help her. Do you remember telling them that? No, I don't. When you left that night, you, you just took your clothes you were wearing in a backpack, right? And you had a knife with you? Did you have any other weapons with you? I had a hammer. Why did you take a knife and a hammer? In case anyone got in my way. Did you have an emotion at the time? I didn't feel anything. You had blood splatter on you, right? Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? I uh, washed it off later on. Did you laugh when you were hitting her? Yeah. Why did you laugh? I just uh, thought she deserved it. So was it a celebration laugh? I'd say it was a uh, uh, celebratory laugh. May I show you a picture? Okay. This is a picture of your mother in that bed that night after you've hit her. That's the picture of your mother's head bashed in that night. What were you thinking right then? I wasn't thinking anything. Were you still laughing? Yeah. Does that sound really warped to you? If you, if you heard that about somebody else, would that sound really, really warped to you? I could understand it if they had the right uh, motive to do it. You can understand they had the right motive. Mm -hmm. This is the hammer. Are these markings on the side of the hammer, are these markings that you put there? I don't remember. These are markings from an alphabet that you created in your journals, where each of these symbols equals a letter, correct? Me and my brother uh, both used to do that. Uh, and um, using your alphabet, can you read what that says? I've decoded it. I just wonder if you know what it says, what you wrote on there, if you wrote it on there. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Would it help your memory if, if I told you that it spells Requiem? Huh? Do you remember writing Requiem? No. On the hammer? Where does this alphabet come from? It's something me and my brother just uh, drew. Uh -huh. Your brother was in the house when this happened, correct? He was asleep, right? Yeah. You then set the house on fire with your brother still in the house, correct? Yeah. Did you intend to burn your brother to death? No. You did not? Why, why did you set the house on fire with him still in it? I wanted to burn my living space. Did you tell the police that you wanted him to suffer? I don't remember. Well, if you had it to do over again, so you could rewind the clock and go back, what would you do? I might kill Josh with a sledgehammer, too. Do you still want to kill Josh? Yes. And you're not going to tell me why? No, sir. Did you want him to suffer? Yeah. You say that your father died when you were nine, but yet he talks to you a lot even now. You actually hear his voice talking to you 
in the here and now, is that correct? Yeah. Did he tell you to do this? Did he tell you to kill your mother? Coming up. Did he say she had cheated on him? That she had gone with other men? Is that what he meant when he said she's a whore? No. What did he mean? Now return to Mentally Ill or Monster, a Dr. Phil exclusive. Something went on at your house today, and I just kind of like you to kind of tell us what happened. I feel like my mom and her sleep Is there a reason why you did that? Yeah, sure. Can you tell me what? Hmm. Yeah, sure. You can't tell me why? I'm sure. Is, there, is it a reason you, you, don't, you don't know why you did it, or you just um, don't want to tell? I think you know why I did it. I just want to not tell. You say that uh, your father died when you were nine, but yet he talks to you a lot even now. Did he tell you to do this? Did he tell you to kill your mother? Yes. What did he tell you? He uh, told me that she deserved it. That, that she deserved it? Did he say why? Yeah. What did he say? He said it was because she was a uh, whore that uh, betrayed him. He said, your mother's a whore, and she betrayed me, and she deserves to die. Uh-huh. And uh, do you talk back to him? Do you respond? Yeah. What did you say to him when he said that to you? I asked him why. Uh -huh. What did he say? He explained it to me. Tell me what he, how he explained it. himself playing. Did he say she had cheated on him? Did she go on with other men? Is that what he meant when he said she's a whore? No. What did he mean? It's because she uh, was with another man almost right after he died. Almost right after he died? Mm -hmm. Have you talked to your brother since this happened? I haven't heard anything about him. He hasn't come to see you? Has he written to you or anything at all? No. There was a letter in your backpack confessing to killing your mother and leaving your brother in the house to burn. Did you write that letter after you killed your mother or did you write it before you killed her? After. So you wrote it there at home? I uh, wrote it while I was on the street. Are you sorry that your mother's dead? Coming up. You wrote a journal entry. I didn't feel anything when I killed her, even when her blood splattered on my arm and her brain matter was thrown onto my shirt. Do you need help? Mentally ill or monster, a Dr. Phil exclusive continues. Are you sorry that your mother's dead? Yes. Why? I feel bad for doing it. But at the time you laughed, why feel bad now? I think it was a stupid thing to do. You wrote a, um, a journal entry. The killing was August 10th at 11 p.m. And on August 11th, this would be the next morning, you wrote, I killed Melanie and left Josh alive to suffer. I didn't feel anything when I killed her, even when her blood splattered on my arm and her brain matter was thrown onto my shirt. I didn't feel remorse, hate, or even satisfaction. 
My only true regret was that I wasn't able to give her a faster death. I didn't want her to suffer. Do you remember writing that? Oh, I think so. On October 17th, you wrote, I've been in jail for nearly two months. Even here, I'm a pariah, but I've ceased to care. That stopped bothering me years ago. The best part is that once again, I'm in Sumner County, home sweet home. It's a bit hard to sleep when your father talks to you all night, no matter how many times you tell him to shut up. Have you felt like a pariah all of your life? No. Did you ever feel like everybody else? Did you ever feel like all the other kids? Do you ever feel like you fit in? When I was little. When did you first start feeling different? I'd say after my father died. Did you get depressed after he died? I think so. Do you need help? Is there something wrong with the way you think? I uh, don't think so. Do you think your emotions are normal? No. What's different about your emotions? What's wrong with them? I feel numb. Do you ever cry? Sometimes. What makes you cry? Uh, something emotional. If you accidentally ran over someone and killed them, would that bother you? I, uh, if it was an accident, I don't think so. You, you smiled again when I asked you that. Why did you smile when I asked you that? I was just uh, thinking of something. What were you thinking? Something uh, about my family. Uh -huh. Can you tell me what it was? I don't know how to describe it to you. Uh -huh. What do you think should happen to you now? Coming up. If we let you walk out that door right here, that you might be working for some guy and you think he's not being fair with you, and you think, well, I could get this can of green beans and go up there and beat his brains out and kill him. We now return to Mentally Ill or Monster, a Dr. Phil exclusive. What do you think should happen to you now? I don't know. Do you care? Yes. What do you want to see happen? Try to get a shorter sentence and uh, right my wrongs when I get out. If you were released today, if they just said, you know what, this just was a really unfortunate situation and we know you didn't mean it and that you're sorry for it and we're going to give you a second chance and we're going to just let you go today and don't do this again, would that be a smart thing for them to do? Yes. Why? I think I know enough now to do what I need to. If I had the power to influence the court to release you, why should I do that? Make your case. I'm able to support my family, and I've changed since I murdered my mother. But I asked you at the time, why did you murder your mother? And you said, well, you know, she wasn't really being a very good mother. And I said, well, did you think about discussing it with her instead of beating her head in with a sledgehammer? And you said, well, I don't know, probably wouldn't have helped. I'm looking at that as your logic trail. Tell me something that causes me to believe you think differently than that. Because to me, that is not healthy thinking. Tell me why we would predict that without massive help, massive treatment and therapy and help to teach you a different set of coping skills 
that if we let you walk out that door right here, that like two weeks from now, three weeks from now, a month from now, you might be working for some guy and you think he's not being fair with you and you think, well, you know, I could quit and get another job or I could get this can of green beans and go up there to the checkout stand and beat his brains out and kill him. What, why would I predict that you would do any differently? We reached out to Zachary's brother for comment and his guardian ad litem gave us this response on his behalf. Mr. Davis denies any of the allegations of sexual assault made by his brother. During Zachary's trial, his brother was called as a witness and testified that he loved his brother and never had any type of sexual contact with him. He called the accusation Zachary had made against him ridiculous. The chief of detectives also took the stand and testified that he contacted the Department of Children's Services and his office investigated the allegations and found no evidence to corroborate Zachary's accusation. We'll be right back. Ready to get real? Go to DrPhil.com for advice on relationships, parenting, finances, and more. Plus, weigh in on your favorite episodes, share your stories, and find support in the Dr. Phil community. When you sign up for the community, you will automatically be subscribed to the Dr. Phil Show newsletter. Log on to DrPhil.com today. Do you want help? Yes. I think you need a lot of help. I think your thinking is is way off. Look, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm sorry you lost your father. I, I, I have two boys. Uh, I, I hate to think of them losing their father because I get to do things with them every day. I'm able to guide them and talk to them and nurture them. And you didn't get to have that since you were nine with your dad. I've looked back through your history and, and you, you've shown a lot of signs of needing help along the way and nobody's ever given it to you. No, nobody's ever really stepped up and said, you're not feeling right, you're not acting right. You need some help. You, the, to, to stand over your mother after bashing her head in with her brain splattered all over your face and laughing, that's so not normal. And for you to go, eh, you know, it's kind of celebratory at the time, it seemed no The fact that that's within realm of normal for you tells me that you need a lot of help. Throwing pills at you and locking you in a cage is not gonna do that. I look in your eyes, I don't, I don't see evil, I see lost. What you did to your mother is a terrible, horrible thing. Do you think you need help? No, I don't know. You don't know whether you need help or not? Yes. Well, the fact that you don't see that screams to me how much help you need. The fact that you're having conversations with your father who's been dead since 07, not just memories of him, but active conversations with him about telling you to kill your whore mother, screams to me that you need help. I wouldn't have more let you walk out that door and turn you loose on society right now than a man in the moon. I'm sorry, I wouldn't do it. That's my opinion. And if you get an opportunity and somebody asks you if you want help, you need to stand up and say not just yes, but hell yes. You can be helped. You're young, your life is not over. You can be helped. I, I haven't done a proper evaluation of you. For me to diagnose you, and I can tell you on my short list of considerations, it is a long, deep, psychotic depression. I, I, I think I would also consider the, the, some potentialities of, 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 of schizophrenia. Hopefully, you, you have very able and competent legal counsel, and I'm confident they are going to advocate very strongly for you to get that help, and hopefully whatever happens, that's going to be a big part of what can happen with you. If you're offered to help, will you take it? Yeah. If there were to be something happen that he was to get some kind of outcome that would involve help, what would that look like? He would still be sentenced uh, to, to a, a prison term, but there are lockdown facilities that provides mental health treatment. You accept that he's going to do a lot of time. You just hope 
that at least a substantial portion of that time is done with this young man getting some help. Without that, he has no chance of a productive life even if he was released. You know, even as his defense lawyer, you're not trying to whitewash what he did. You're saying he did it, he needs to be accountable for it. You're just saying, let's try to do something constructive to put this young man back on the radar at some point, even if it's in his 40s. That's correct. He had just turned 15 years old when this happened. He was a troubled young man that whole time and never received any kind of treatment or any kind of attention that would have helped him steer away from this situation. I just don't want to see him, his life completely wasted. Well, in my view, he's clearly a, a, a broken young man at this point and I said it to him and I wasn't trying to be ugly to your client I was just telling him the truth you need a lot well, of help I was glad that you said that because I, I've been trying to convince him of that for some time and it's nice to have someone else make that same suggestion to him thank you so much thank you it's nice meeting you according to Zachary's attorney anyone who encountered the teen knew something was deeply wrong what we need to learn from this gruesome and horrifying crime is how to prevent this from happening again. Teachers, neighbors, acquaintances, friends, we need to make sure children who show signs of mental illness get the treatment and help they need before tragedy occurs. After we recorded this interview, Zachary Davis stood trial for the murder of his mother and the attempted murder of his brother. He surprised everyone, including his attorney, when he took the stand and tried to blame the entire crime on his brother, which led his lawyer to ask for a mistrial. It was not granted, and a jury convicted Zachary of first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, and aggravated arson. Zachary reportedly sat motionless while the verdict was read. He was sentenced to life in prison. For more information, go to drphil.com. Thanks for watching.